Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Crystal Miller, your host and moderator with Tripwire today. Thank you for taking this time to join us for today's presentation. Our webcast topic is based on a recent Poneman report on the state of risk-based security management. Our two speakers today, Cindy Valladeris and Dwayne Melanson, will present the study's findings and they're going to take a further look at whether organizations are really walking the risk-based security management talk. And if, and for those organizations that are, what does that really mean? And how far along are they or are you in their risk manage management programs? Before I introduce our speakers today, I wanted to take this moment to to let you know how you can engage with us during today's presentation. First, um, in, in your webcast player, you can submit questions at any time today on the, by using the questions button. You can also uh, interact with us on Twitter. So if you, if you want to join us, we are using the hashtag pound risky biz, and you'll see that on the next slide. So um, at this time, I'd like to now introduce today's speakers, both Dwayne Melanson and Cindy Valladeris. Dwayne joined Tripwire in 2000 and is Tripwire's Chief Technology Officer. In the number of years that Dwayne has been with Tripwire, you can only imagine he has had many different responsibilities here as we've evolved and grown as a company. Some of his previous positions with Tripwire were uh, Head of Product, Vice President of Log Management, business development, professional services and support, information systems, and marketing. Prior to joining Tripwire, Dwayne's experience is really extensive, and, but in short, he has worked at Direct Web, Symantec, and Fifth Generation Systems Incorporated. Dwayne is certified on both IT management and audit processes, holding both ITIL and CISA certifications. When Duane is not at the Tripwire headquarters in Portland, Oregon, actually like today, he is in the field collaborating, partnering, and learning with other IT risk and security professionals all around the world. Next, I'd like to introduce Cindy Valladeris. She's our product marketing manager at Tripwire with her primary focus on incident detection and working with our log sim solutions. Cindy is also Tripwire's advocate and social media strategist, so many of you are likely to have already connected with her, whether it's on Twitter, you might have seen some of our InfoSec YouTube videos, or read something written by her on our State of Security Tripwire blog. And prior to Tripwire, Cindy marketed technology products and solutions for over 10 years, and She's presented at numerous conferences in North America, Europe, and Latin America. So with that, I'd, like now, I'd now like to turn it over to both Dwayne and Cindy to get us started. Dwayne, Cindy? Thank Good you. afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today, uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, Dwayne, I'll let you say hello before I get um, things started. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Great, thank you. So, um, as Crystal was mentioning this morning, we are going to, actually this afternoon, I apologize, it's still very early for me, so coffee hasn't kicked in yet. Um, it, we um, we in started working with the Poneman Institute to do this uh, risk-based security management report because we've seen a lot of interest in um, security professionals, information security professionals, to talk to non-technical executives. And uh, we find that risk management is actually a good framework to have those conversations uh, in that unlocks some budgets and resources for you. Uh, the other thing that we saw, we've seen, is that uh, when we look at our budget on a yearly basis and where we're spending, the habitual spending and security is not necessarily aligned with the business objectives and goals. And risk management actually provides a framework to rethink the way we allocate our resources it, with those limited budgets that we have. Now, all of us probably have seen the mainstream media pick up a lot of the data breaches and, uh, you know, uh, 
threats that are coming out there, whether that's FLAME and Stuxnet and breaches to large organizations. So where we were used to before to only seeing the news uh, break out in publications specifically to information security, now the Wall Street Journal, CNN, those types of organizations and publications are interested in that, which that means that the business guys are paying now attention and, and starting to realize, oh, there's actually there, um, something there. And on the last part, compliance is also driving a lot of the conversations around risk, especially compliance in countries like Germany, Netherlands, and the UK, where it's really driven by that uh, goal of protecting data and um, mitigating risk. So we embark on that journey because of that. So before I proceed any further, I would like to ask you a question in terms of where are you in your maturity cycle? And you'll see a, a voting question here popping up in a minute. And if you could take a minute to only answer one of those questions, and we will see uh, later on uh, as we move along in the, in, in the presentation the results of those questions. So if you could take a minute and answer those questions in the voting section of, of your screen. And once you're done voting, you can just click on the close window and you'll get back to the presentation. We'll leave it open for a few minutes. Um, and as we talk, you can, you can keep on voting. I'm just going to proceed to the next slide in the meantime, but feel free to keep on joining us. I'm starting to see a lot of response coming through, so thank you. I thought it would be great before we start talking about risk-based security management to define what we're talking about because uh, there is a lot of different definitions out there in the industry. And I think to the purest sense, what we're talking about here is what is, what is the likelihood of something happening to our organization and what's the impact of that. So, you know, t take the probability and take an impact, uh, you know, in now, when we, when we talk about those two items, we certainly need to do certain steps before then, or we need to consider, um, you know, different pieces of context, like threats, vulnerabilities, what's important to the business, um, not necessarily to security, but what are we trying to achieve? You know, if we are in the business of logistics, well, in time, uh, delivery might be important. If we are in the business of, um, you know, uh, uh, services, well, quality may be an, uh, the most important. If we are in the business of transacting uh, uh, credit card information, where credit card or, uh, information becomes really important. So what, what is that uh, impact to the business? And we're not talking here about enterprise risk management, which is the larger umbrella, but we are talking about specific risk management that applies to information security. And the goal of this is to enable the business uh, not be the no-sayers, but actually be the enablers, the, the yes um, in security, if you will. So let me just provide you a little bit of background about the report that we just uh, undertook. We had over 2,000 individual responses in four different countries, the US, the UK, Germany, and the Netherlands. And I'm actually going to show you through the presentation the difference in the responses because in, uh, of all of those four countries because it's, it's really, really interesting, the differences that come through and uh, the maturity levels and perceived uh, risks and uh, threats uh, that we all have uh, based on the countries that we live in. It was commissioned by Tripwire, and it was conducted by the Ponemon Institute, which is an independent third-party organization. And you know, in terms of uh, demographics, we had a wide variety of industries representative, representative. I would say the majority of them fall into financial services, public sector, retail, a little bit of health and pharma services and education, but we have energy, hospita hospitality, uh, a lot of other ones. If you are interested in obtaining all of that information specifically to your country, um, you'll see a link at the end, which is tripwire.com slash 2012 where you can download the reports. 
And in terms of job titles, who were those people? We had, uh, you know, people from vice presidents, director, managers, all the way to technicians, people who deal with the day-to-day -day, uh, security. Now, we um, covered a lot of the reports, uh, talk about perceptions, talk about relationships between maturity and security posture, the evolving role of the CISO, and comparison in different countries. Now, for the sake of your time, so that I don't have you stuck in a webcast for three hours um, and get into your pub time here, uh, we're going to focus on three findings. What we find was that there was um, high commitment, but not necessarily everyone was doing uh, what they need to do for, for having a successful risk management program. The second one was that it, there is an unbalanced approach to information and risk management, and we're going to share some of those results with you. And the third one is that the lack of metrics to measure the success is inhibiting us from being more successful. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Duane so that he can start talking about the first finding about lots of talk and starting to walk. Thanks a lot, Cindy, and uh, hello, everyone. And uh, as Crystal kind of alluded to, I am uh, calling from an airport today, so background noise, uh, noise I apologize in advance. But uh, happy to spend some time with you today and talk a little bit about some of the key findings of this report. Um, the first one, as Cindy mentioned, is really that we've, we're seeing that there is a lot of talk, but people are beginning to do some of the right things in terms of adopting risk-based security management. Uh, so if we start with the level of commitment, you know, pretty consistently across each country, uh, i.e. that the commitment is pretty high. So, uh, you know, north of 70 percent, and in some cases, like in the case of Germany, over 80 of the organizations say that they either have a significant commitment or a very significant commitment to risk-based security management. I think this is good because um, I believe that risk is one of the best lenses for us to really evaluate how we're spending our time, resources, and effort. Uh, in attacking security, and uh, it's also a great way for us to translate from some of the activities into some of the results and how they support the goals of the business. So I think this is a, a really good start. But, um, you know, when we dig a little deeper, commitment is not enough. So now let's look at whether a formal... Uh, um, so in the U.K., less than half of the organizations surveyed actually had anything really uh, formally in place uh, in, in terms of risk management strategy. Uh, on the right side of the slide, Germany and the Netherlands actually are in better shape there, where you see that somewhere around 60% of the organizations there uh, actually are a little further along with formal risk management. But you still get into almost a, like a 60-40 split there, where um, you know roughly two-thirds of the organizations that uh, that we studied uh, don't have any kind of formal risk management strategy in place. And uh, in the case of, if you look at uh, the UK, the, the, the lighter pie slice there, 29%, 23%, and Netherlands, uh, those are the places where people really have informal or ad, ad hoc approaches to risk management. And uh, what we found is that the ad hoc ones tend to be either crisis driven or they tend to be things that don't have clear ownership in the organization, so they kind of get tossed around like a, a hot potato and uh, aren't necessarily going to be very effective. So uh, from a practical perspective, when you look at the people who don't have uh, a strategy in place or those who have informal or ad hoc, there's not necessarily a lot of difference in terms of the outcomes that you see. Um, the next data I'd like to share with you is uh, whether an actual function or program exists. So the first, uh, last question was really around whether there is a recognized strategy. Does anyone have any formal ownership of this in the organization? And you'll see that uh, the UK and the US are fairly similar. Roughly half of the organizations don't have a formal risk management function or program, and the other half uh, do. And then in uh, Germany and the Netherlands, again, we see similar results where uh, Sixty percent or so of the organizations actually have a recognized risk management function in place, and forty percent don't. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing here is how, um, and and we saw this throughout the survey, how closely the responses in the UK and the US aligned, and how closely the responses from Germany and the Netherlands 
uh, aligned. And uh, some of this, I believe, is, uh, you know, from some of the conversations we've had, how people view risk. And, uh, you know, from uh, Germany and the Netherlands' perspective, compliance is analogous to risk, where people uh, feel that some of their biggest risks are, uh, you know, failing to comply with some of the local regulations and some of the, the constructs that are required of them. Uh, whereas in the U.K. and the U.S., the focus tends to be more on risk from outside attackers and things like that. So a slightly different perspective on risk. And the interesting thing was that, that the uh, responses aligned pretty closely across uh, those two clusters. Um, so then when we look at how far along people actually are, uh, things are a lot more similar. So what this measures is, you know, from the top part of each graph, bottom is, is or are you. So the top line is the mature stage, the next line is late middle stage, and the line in the middle there is the middle stage, and then we go down from there. Uh, what we found is that uh, you see a pretty typical bell curve distribution where uh, the majority of organizations are in that middle stage. And, um, you know, the encouraging thing to me is that there's about an equal number of people in the middle stage as there are in the combined late, middle, and mature stages. Um, the reason I think this is encouraging is because a lot of organizations are beginning to take action and beginning to adopt good risk-based man uh, risk uh, security management practices in their organization. Um, and the other part of this I think is that you know, another population that they can learn from in terms of these mature and late middle stage uh, maturity organizations. Um, and, you know, so uh, at this time I'd like to uh, kind of take a look at the votes uh, or the, the polling today. So we'll stop the polling now and uh, take a look at the results. And, um, you know, not a big surprise here. What we see is that the shape of the answers actually mirrors the study pretty closely where uh, you know, roughly 40% of the organizations are in that middle stage where most risk management programs are only partially deployed, um, and then another 30% are in those top two brackets, um, and then another roughly 28% uh, in the, the bottom two. So, really consistent with uh, the results that we saw through the through the survey. Now, uh, one note on the survey itself is that this is the first year we've done this particular study um, using the Panaman Institute to, uh, to handle that for us. Uh, this is something we'd like to continue to do year over year so that we can track progress because one of the things I think is happening is that risk is becoming front and center in a lot more conversations and people are actually taking definitive action based on some of these risk discussions and we'd like to see how that changes uh, year over year and how it changes from country to country. Um, so uh, you stay tuned. You'll see more from us uh, as we move through time here on uh, further surveys. And I really approve votes on this because that's another thing that we want to track is from, uh, you know, each time we go through this with different audiences, does the uh, shape of the curve actually match what we expect it to, to look like? So. Uh, then we, we move on to, you know, not from what they're doing, but into what the perceived benefits of risk-based security management. And again, we see that kind of alignment between the U.K. and the U.S. versus uh, Germany and the Netherlands, where in the U.K. and the U.S., a lot of the focus on the perceived benefits is really around reduced cost in security programs. Um, in contrast, in Germany and the Netherlands, because there's such a focus on compliance, uh, the key focus of the risk-based security management approaches is really to improve compliance with laws and regulation. You know, those kinds of things, um, you know, we, we saw, we thought we, it was interesting, The again, the alignment between uh, the two groups of countries. Um, so this is another view of that, where if you look at the, the benefits and how they differ by region, and there's a lot more detail in the, the full report on this, but I think at a glance what you see is that there's uh, almost like, uh, you know, a, a symmetrical agreement here, where in the U.K. and the U.S., you see that security program cost reduction is very high, and roughly the 20% range we've got uh, compliance. And then in Germany and the Netherlands, we see exactly the reverse. So, uh, again, I think this is uh, kind of based on what people are charged with. And uh, the other 
come out through conversations in Germany and the Netherlands is that there is less questions being asked by uh, non-technical executives around what security is really doing, whereas in the U.S. and the U.K., uh, we've heard a lot more anecdotal evidence that there are conversations where non-technical executives are, are kind of asking for some accountability and, you know, what are you doing to protect us and uh, trying to tie that back into, um, you know, basically rationalizing cost. So to kind of sum this up, what we find is that most organizations, like the vast majority, are talking about risk-based security management, and most of them claim to be very serious about it. But overall, across the whole uh, population of the study, less than half actually have formal strategies or procedures of, as you saw. Right. Overall, I think there's some, uh, some work to do for us to uh, formalize this a bit more and create some repeatability and, and enable us to get some more prescriptive benefits out of this from a business perspective. Um, so that really kind of wraps up the first uh, finding, and I'd like to now hand it over to Cindy to talk about the second area of the findings. Thank you, Duane. Um, very interesting dynamics here as we see the results from uh, the different countries. But let's talk about um, why do we say that there is an unbalanced approach to risk and security. So the first, um, we asked a couple of questions asking people, you know, out of the eight layers in um, information security, which ones do you see as having um, the biggest risk to your organization, as posing the biggest risk to your organization? And people responding uh, responded, and that's the second column that we see in all of these graphs. Then we also asked them, so how much of your budget are you spending in all of these different layers? And the results were really surprising. Uh, what we can see across the board in all of them is that both the network layer and the application layer are out of sync. Uh, especially on the network layer, you know, we're allocating a lot of budget to it, but the risk is not very high, and the other way around on the application layer. Not spending a lot of money, risk is very high. So we had a few follow-up questions that we didn't ask on the report. We ask ourselves, uh, why is that? You know, are we spending out of uh, habit what we're used to? Or as someone else in a webcast yesterday um, asked as well, or do we spend because we are comfortable using certain um, technologies or tools to do the job? Don't know the answer to that. But um, it might be another symptom of the fact that most people's approach to risk is not adaptive. Uh, the risk landscape changes, but their habits and approaches and the way we want to solve information security and spending is not um, adapting or changing to uh, the different risks, uh, evolving risks that come along. Uh, the second, uh, another set of questions that we ask is, uh, these are some common preventive controls that most organizations have in place. So what would you say in terms of how you deploy these controls? And uh, I know it's very hard to read when you have that many, that much information in the slide chart. But the takeaway here is that most organizations, in terms of putting policies and procedures in place and malware detection and prevention, um, NAC tools, hardening, you know, they're doing pretty well, you know, from a high of 96 down to, you know, 47s on the training side. But when we asked um question in terms of what kind of detective controls do you have in place, the picture is very different. And it's very different across all of the countries. Uh, probably the most... Um, uh, the, organ, um, the country that has the most set of these well-developed is Germany with 73% on the highest one. But the rest don't start at 98%. So this poses a very interesting question. You know, Detective controls are there to keep monitoring uh, what you put in place on your protective controls. So if you have policies in place, but you have no way of continuously checking and monitoring to make sure that those are enforced and in place, then, you know, are you actually holding people accountable to do their jobs or are you just, you know, trusting um, and hoping that it will, uh, it will become so? Uh, 
uh, you know, there's a model out there that says zero trust to information security, and this may become valid here, you know, um, as we talk about detective controls. You know, trust is not a control, and hope is not a strategy, as uh, Duane likes to say it. Um, the other the other question that becomes really interesting here uh, is in terms of uh, you know what are the basic steps that people take in risk management and I'm using risk management again just as a shortcut for risk based security management but regardless of what framework you use or have in place there is a set of um, there's a set of of steps that people do from identifying the key information to your business, categorizing that information, identifying the threats, assessing the vulnerabilities, the risks, and then to identify and control and, and implement those controls and monitoring them continuously. But if we look at the bottom part, those are probably the first four are probably the ones that people are doing pretty well. The last four were not doing so well on the detective side. Let's take a look at how the audience responded, um, how the surveyed audience responded to this question. So we asked them of those eight steps, how are you coming along? And here we see a similar picture that what we've seen before in terms of contrast with the US and UK, very aligned in terms of what they're doing, and Germany and Netherlands a little bit ahead of the curve, uh, especially Germany, in identifying the information. One of the things that I saw here is, well, it makes sense, right? If you're not doing the first steps, it's harder to do the rest ones, which are more difficult. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a question as well where we can test, you know, people say there's a high commitment to risk-based management, but are they actually doing the steps to make it so? We're making progress on the first steps. We need a lot more help on the latter four. Ah, so in terms of risk assessment and controls, uh, this is not meant for you to read all of those graphics. I'm not intending you to take out your, um, you know, your your uh, extra special lenses here, uh, but when we look at, uh, we also asked uh, the questions in terms of, you know, how, how do you, how do the, the mature organizations, those who have a formal uh, process in place, how do they uh, view the steps and in terms of less mature organizations? And we see that it falls, less mature organizations are obviously going to have uh, the processes the steps uh, followed in uh, to a lesser degree, but the one that really sees the most disparity between the high and low maturity is the UK. The other ones, especially the Netherlands, very very few difference between low and high maturity, but the UK respondents have the biggest delta here. So let's wrap up this section by doing a summary here. Um, what we see is that security resources are not aligned with the perceived risks that they, they, they have. We actually asked, I didn't have time to cover this in this report, but in terms of what are you afraid of, um, what we call the security fright index, and uh, it, it's very different in each of the countries, so I encourage you to download the report, um, but it, that's not aligned with uh, specifically what happens out there. For example, in the U.S., uh, the majority of the people were concerned about malicious insiders, but in reality, when you read the DBIR report from Verizon, only about 4% happens from malicious insiders. So, um, you know, in terms of an unbalanced approach, that's another snippet of information. We also see that in terms of preventative preventive and detective controls. Organizations are, are making very good progress on the first set of preventive controls, but we need some help on the detective controls, uh, which means that we have really good expectations of what people want to do, but really no way to enforce that or hold others accountable. And uh, if you're focusing a lot of your efforts into what should I do next, and if you are in those high maturity uh, organizations, you may want to focus your efforts on those on the last four critical steps. 
with that being said, Dwayne, I'll let you uh, take over for the third finding. Thanks a lot, Cindy. And uh, here we'll talk about the third, which is that um, there was uh, a weakness in the area of metrics. So uh, not necessarily in having uh, metrics in place, but having effective metrics in place. And uh, so let's look at overall how people are using metrics. Um, what we found was that, you know, in uh, U.S. and U.K., approximately half of the organizations didn't have metrics in place. Uh, both had about 5% unsure, and uh, around 40 to 45% were actually using metrics to measure success. Um, again, you see an alignment between Germany and the Netherlands, where um, roughly 60% of the organizations have or, uh, metrics in place, and 40% uh, do not, and 2 uh, to 3%. Uh, are unsure. So then we wanted to find out what people are actually measuring, and um, in terms of what is being measured, uh, what we found was that cost really floated to the top of the list. So reduction in the cost of security management activities uh, really stuck out as one of the key indicators that people are uh, are actually measuring. And um, this is an area where even though we did see that difference between the focus on benefits being cost in the U.S. and the U.K., and uh, compliance being the, the focus in Germany and the Netherlands, all of them came out with cost as one of their top metrics, um, along with reduction in unplanned system downtime, uh, number of end users receiving appropriate training, and so forth. Um, so when we drill in a little bit more on the details of this, this is where you see this. So at the top of everyone's list in roughly, you know, 40 to almost 50% in one case, um, reduction in the cost of security management activities is the key measure. Um, one of the things that concerns me about this is that I think this is a good indicator, but it's not a good metric. And what I mean by that is, you know, if given a certain dollar spending or a certain percentage of budget, um, if I doubled that for you, would your security get twice as good? No. If I cut it in half, would it get twice as bad? Not necessarily. So uh, I think cost is a good indicator, and it's a good effectively kind of a benchmark, but um, it isn't really what I believe is a, a primary metric. Now, one of the reasons I think that cost is such a big deal is, you know, one, a lot of non-technical parts of the business really want to know how money is being spent across the business, and one of the areas they look at is uh, information security program spend, and because they don't know what else to ask about, they tend to focus a lot on cost, and I think that's one of the dynamics that drives that. Um, when you look at some of the other metrics, there actually are some that I believe are effective metrics. So, you know, first I'll start with two that I think are uh, kind of, you know, I think of them as red herring or, or uh, false flag kinds of metrics, and that's the too much of a focus on cost. And the other is reduction in the number of known vulnerabilities, um, because I don't believe the reduction in the number of known vulnerabilities is something that's under the direct control of the information security organization. Rather, I'd rather see some metrics around what we're doing to mitigate those vulnerabilities and what controls we're trying to put in place to compensate for them, um, which is something we can control. And uh, a little bit, I've got some examples of some metrics I've seen that, that tend to, uh, to work a little better in driving the right behavior and the right decisions around how security resources get deployed. Um, so kind of the overall summary for this, and there's a ton of detail in the report, and it breaks things out by uh, a lot more factors than we reviewed here, um, but effectively less than half of the organizations overall are using metrics for risk-based security management. And then when you dig into what they're actually measuring for the ones that do have metrics in place, many of them are using what I consider to be false flag metrics around cost and number of vulnerabilities. So with that, I'll transition a little bit into some of the interpretation and field observations and, and recommendations that we have. Um, you know, it's a combination of things that were recommended in the report and some of our own interpretation from uh, talking with a number of folks around the world. So first, I'd like to share um, some examples of metrics that I've seen that are working and driving some positive change in the different organizations that we've worked with. Um, I like to break them up kind of into three categories. One is leading indicators, one is lagging indicators, and then the third is just really indicators of overall effectiveness. So examples of leading indicators, and to me these are things that, um, you know, basically help you assess your risk posture and help you better prepare and reduce your attack surface and reduce the likelihood that you will have, you know, some kind of a service impacting event or a compliance issue or a security incident 
or something like that. And, and a category of those for me is configuration quality. Um, so, for example, um, you could look at the number uh, or the percentage of configurations that are compliant with your target security standards. And this is an area where I think it needs to be aligned with risk rankings. And uh, so, for example, if you categorize things as, you know, critical, high, medium, low, uh, you may set a target to say that 95% of our uh, systems in um, the critical group must be fully compliant with our target security standards at any given time, and anything below that is unacceptable. Or you may say that, uh, you know, in the less critical ones, like perhaps in the medium, it has to be 75% or more. And the reason this is important is because um, if you try to apply equal uh, scrutiny and equal rigor across your entire infrastructure, you'll drive yourself and the organization crazy because there just aren't enough hours in the day. So by um, using the risk rankings to help prioritize the work and prioritize the targets and, uh, you know, kind of the objectives, um, you can be a lot more effective in how you deploy your resources. Um, that middle category, which is what I consider to be more uh, the lagging indicators, are um, some of the metrics I've seen work are things like the percentage of incidents detected by an automated control. Um, this is good in a couple of ways. One, it helps you understand how well you're doing at catching incidents, but more importantly, it helps you identify how well you're using automation to take some of the human effort and the requirement that you you know, always rely on humans who are paying attention at all times because, um, you know, it can be an overwhelming amount of data or it can be just a monotonous task, and eventually someone will miss something, and the more you can drive to an automated approach, policy-based, that's repeatable and automatable, um, the more uh, effective you'll be in terms of catching the incidents more quickly, categorizing them quickly, and dealing with them quickly. And also, this does address that concern that we see from the rest of the business in terms of driving costs down because um, a lot of the efficiencies can be driven through some automated control uh, implementations. And then the third category is really around security program progress. And um, a couple that I've seen that have worked really well in some of the organizations that we've studied is uh, tracking the percentage of staff by business area that have completed security training. Um, and I'm, I've worked with a few organizations recently that started there and felt like this was a good thing to track because, uh, you know, particularly when we look into the uh, security fright index, there's a lot of concern about, um, you know, employees' use of social media around, um, you know, malicious insiders, about employee carelessness and things like that. And a lot of those things can be addressed or at least mitigated through uh, a, a strong security program. Uh, that includes employee training. Um, a couple of the organizations have now moved beyond that to say, okay, in this next phase, what we want to do is not just measure who's been trained, but how well it's sticking, and have gone into measuring uh, uh, the average scores on a security recall test. And this allows them to understand which parts of the organizations are kind of getting it and retaining it, and which ones need more work and more education. Um, one of the other couple of things across all these that I'd like to comment on. Uh, one, particularly in the security program progress area, you see that it's broken out by business area. Uh, we've seen that that really works well in terms of driving executive attention, um, or what I refer to as kind of tone at the top um, in, in these organizations, because uh, it creates some competition between the different business units and the different business functions, and nobody really wants to be at the bottom of the list. So if you can find the right metric, rank them against each other, you can drive some good uh, behaviors where people will actually try to push their employees to do better and pay more attention and retain things better, and uh, you'll see some benefits there. Um, the other comment I have on this is you notice a lot of these um, are focused on percentages, and the reason I like percentages is because they scale really well. You know, as the organization at various sizes of organization, you can base your targets on percentages, and uh, it helps you uh, manage things much more effectively than if you try to focus on the exact number. Um, you know, so, uh, for example, like in that configuration quality area, number of unauthorized changes is good. I would say that percentage of unauthorized changes might be even better because it would allow you to compare uh, more of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison from one business unit to another or one application group to another. Um, so, you know, these by no means are one-size-fits-all metrics. Uh, what I've been doing is collecting different metrics from people uh, to try to really create 
you know, almost like a, a reference list and uh, working with different organizations to identify what metrics might work best to achieve their goals because it's not going to be the same for every organization. Um, so one of the things I'd love, if, if you have effective metrics or if you have metrics that you feel are not working and you're not really sure what to do about them, if you want to engage with us, you'll see some information later on in this about how to work with us on either Twitter or the blog or something like that. We'd love to collaborate with you and find out more about uh, some of your metrics challenges and, and help you uh, perhaps uh, crack some of those, uh, those problems. Uh, the other thing is if you are a Gartner client, I recommend that you look at some of the work that's being done by Paul Proctor and Jeffrey Wheatman in terms of metrics and leading indicators uh, because I think they're doing some great work in this area. Um, so let's take a look at not just at the metrics, but how organizations are tending to approach this. Um, first, I see a lot of organizations who are either investigating or actively adopting a repeatable framework. You know, some people are looking at FAIR, some are looking at Octave, some are looking at, you know, variations or homegrown things or ISO models and things like that. Um, I think the key is to not make it overly complex if you can. Keep it as simple as you can. Um, I would recommend focusing on some high-priority areas, whether those are critical infrastructure or really important business processes that drive revenue or customer attention or fulfillment or something like that, because uh, getting this to grab hold will require people to change their habits. And doing it um, in small bites and across, you know, starting with more important pieces of the infrastructure will actually help you. Um, the second is to uh, a lot of organizations are moving to risk ranking and scoring methods. And, again, this is an area where don't, don't get too complicated. Uh, I've seen organizations that have three and four level uh, rankings, like, you know, one through four, one through five, uh, high, medium, low, critical high, medium, low, those kinds of things. And I think the, the more straightforward methods uh, actually are where you get the most benefit. Um, the third, which I think is really emerging as a best practice across the organizations I've been discussing this with, is to establish some cross-functional steering committees to help you examine risks more holistically. Um, you know, so one of the challenges with risk-based security management, it is very focused on securities activities and securities investment. And I find that um, it helps really to, to better connect this to the rest of the organization when you have people who are able to look at strategic and operational risk at, you know, uh, having HR involved to talk about employment practices and how you minimize the risk of hiring employees who are likely to cause problems or how you uh, cleanly, when employees leave the organization, that you ensure no loose ends are, are left around that would increase your risk. Um, looking at your physical uh, security and how it integrates with um, information security and so on and so forth. Um, so I've seen a lot of organizations that have put together these committees that are comprised of maybe people from a G&A function or a finance function, uh, from legal, from sales, from business units, from marketing, and so forth, um, so that you can have a conversation that's more holistically considering risk. And it also helps you with this fourth bullet, which is prioritizing things, you know, because it helps you understand where the highest risk and impact would be, uh, where the benefits are, and helps you rationalize security investments compared to other things like maybe a, a marketing program investment or improvements in a, uh, an ERP system or something like that. Uh, and then the last area is moving toward um, establishing key risk indicators and key risk objectives to help you measure progress. And this is another area where um, both Jeffrey Wheatman and Paul Proctor of Gardner have done some, some great work. So. Um, with that, I'd like to hand things back to Cindy for a, a bit to <clears throat> talk about um, some of the inhibitors to adopting risk-based security management. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, seems like I'm the bearer of bad news now that you've uh, talked about some of the good things that people are doing. But what are some of the um, stumbling blocks that are prohibiting us from moving to a more risk-oriented uh, organization? The first one is when we consider that we want to do everything all at the same time, or what we call the boil the ocean approach. You know, not every risk is created equal, and uh, if you try to focus on everything, you'll never get anything done. So pick one or two areas that relate to the business objective that the people are trying to accomplish. Um, again, you know, uh, whether that is in terms of compliance to laws and regulations or how that 
uh, impacts revenue cost, customer satisfaction, or other key processes in the business, that becomes um, an easier conversation to have. And an early win there will prove more success in, in future conversations. The uh, same uh, idea of, of um, you know, uh, crawl, walk, and then run. Uh, you tell a story, Duane, about this um, hospital uh, that was doing, uh, I think it was a hospital, but it was doing a, a risk assessment and came back with a ton of risk. And, um, well, I'll let you tell that story in terms of, you know, what they found and what they wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, so this is an area where they had just recently done a, uh, a security assessment, and um, they called me up, and they were a little bit panicked because they felt like, uh, you know, wow, we have all of these uh, these things we've got to do and all these risks we, we haven't covered and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, one of the things that I felt was interesting is, uh, you know, all these risks existed before the assessment was done. You know, so um, it, it's it's not like the risks aren't out there. It's just, you know, people are afraid in some cases to kind of discover them because then you have to do something about them. And uh, I think like in this uh, hospital organization, what we did was we really uh, sat down again with that cross-functional group and had a conversation about, you know, how do we put all these risks in context? Which ones are actually the biggest deal for the organization? Which ones are going to affect our ability to deliver good service to the patient? And we rank things with some executive buy-in um, to, to really help, um, you know, prioritize this and, and kind of take bite-sized pieces of it. And, uh, you know, so I think all these things can kind of work together, but, you know, as soon as you can tap into uh, some kind of executive visibility and sponsorship, and have people uh, kind of demand that you do something about it, but doing it in an ordered fashion, the better off you'll be. And actually, that falls into the second bullet here in terms of inhibitors and, and no tone at the top. It's very difficult for us in the security space to have any relevance to the business if they just don't see um, the efforts that that our um, that our activities have towards the mitigating those risks and uh, providing information that is valuable to them. So some of the things that we could do is to change our language to the language of the business and align to what they're doing. The third one is uh, no or ineffective metrics. And Dwayne covered a full section on why the lack of metrics is having an impact into what we do and the importance of focusing on more than just cost metrics. So I won't dwell too much into these two. Now let's wrap it up with some recommendations um, that we have. Based on the information that we saw coming in from all of these different countries, we recommend that a formal uh, risk-based security management program uh, is set in place with a formal strategy uh, in place and with the tone at the top again. Um, that you look at all of your different preventive and detective controls and see if there's any gaps in there, whether you're putting a lot of attention on the preventive sides but not a lot on the detective sides, uh, whether you can automate some of them, as, as Duane was saying, that's where you can get a lot of efficiencies done and detective controls are prime uh, for doing that. And then the fourth one is to establish and use some metrics to demonstrate program success. Because as you start moving along and you start seeing the impact of your efforts, people want to come and, and get more of you. Dwayne, anything that you would like to add um, on this section before we open up for questions? Um, yeah, I would just say, you know, talking a little bit about the balance of preventive and detective controls, um, I think, you know, one of the things that is was clear in some of the conversations we've had is that um, it isn't just a matter of, oh, give me more money and I'll uh, add some detective controls. In a lot of cases, it, it is evaluating the controls that you have in place and figuring out which ones are keepers and which ones are not. Um, you know, so I've seen organizations that use a uh, that start tracking things like, okay, I, I've invested in this specific control. Um, has it ever helped me? You know, has it ever detected an incident? Has it ever detected a violation? Has it ever, um, you know, given me given me something that caused me to either make a dis different decision or take action? And if the answer is no, that might be a category where, 
you know, or a candidate where you could uh, take that investment and move it somewhere else. And I see uh, a couple of organizations I work with now have an annual, um, you know, technology review process where they start looking into some of the controls that they've implemented, you know, what they're paying for, and are looking at the benefits that they're getting and measuring them against, um, you know, the cost and saying, you know, am I, is this really serving me well or would my money be better spent in another area? Um, the other area is like if you're looking at the preventive controls and you want to find out where you may have uh, control weaknesses, you know, are there specific policies that you're frustrated with constantly because people are breaking the rules and, you know, there's no consequence um, or they break the rules and they get away with it? You know, that may be an area where either you have a lack of tone at the top or you have inadequate detective controls to be able to hold people accountable. So, you know, there are a lot of tips and tricks around how to slice and dice where your investments are placed. But, um, you know, I think looking at as much as you can an objective means of determining whether the controls are actually delivering the value you expect um, is a good start. And I think a risk-based security model um, can actually help with that by framing things in, in the context of risk. Yeah, and very interesting point that you make. I was talking with a CISO here in Portland where he uses the SANS top 20 controls to um, for for his risk management approach, and he actually decided that some of them, uh, he didn't want to bring them up to 100% or 80% because for him it wasn't paying off. Uh, he was willing to take the risk. Uh, the payoff wasn't there for him. So it, it's different for every organization for sure. Yeah, and that's the other thing I think that where there's value in looking at it each year because not only does, uh, you know, your budget change, but the security threat landscape changes, business priorities may change, the business environment may change, and uh, that's why it's important to have a, a dynamic way of looking at this so that you can adjust things uh, to more align with your risk posture or your business's requirements over time. Correct. Um, so I, I see a couple of questions here coming through. Uh, we'll take the time to answer as, ma as many as we can. Um, if you haven't submitted your questions and you have one, uh, please do so. There's also a, a link at the top of your page that says attachments. You can go straight, straight from there to the website, that the URL that it's on your screen where you can download both the U.S. and U.K. report. The Germany and the Netherlands one is coming here shortly uh, within a week. So if you don't see them there now, uh, please come back uh, visiting uh, us. So let's see the first question is um, if we review the differences between the industry sectors and uh, were there any of the companies uh, leading the way to their compliance requirements, you know, there there was a lot of information and we decided to slice and dice the data based on maturity levels and also based on where they fall in in their organizational title. We didn't we haven't done yet an industry split. That would be really interesting to do. Um but with that many respondents we haven't done so. What, what have you seen, Dwayne, in terms of different industries and what they've done from compliance that actually has have has it helped them? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, anecdotally, um, I believe it has because one of the things I think that, um, that has been, uh, you know, one of the positive outcomes, I guess, of compliance is that uh, many of the compliance frameworks force a top-down risk-based assessment. Um, you know, so whether it's for scoping purposes or for prioritization of controls, uh, a lot of the compliance um, frameworks and regimes really push people toward a more risk-based view of the world. You know, so obviously there are some out there that are more checkbox oriented, but uh, most of them at least have a component of scoping, which which drives you to that. And from what we've seen, you know, it's, it's if I had to predict what the, where the numbers would come in, I would say that we would see. Um, that, you know, financial services organizations, insurance companies, uh, and regulated industries like perhaps healthcare, uh, gaming, those kinds of things may um, emerge as kind of the, uh, you know, being ahead of the curve in terms of compliance uh, or risk-based security management adoption basically being pushed by regulations and compliance. Uh, we haven't done that analysis yet, but, uh, you know, based on my anecdotal information, I would predict that's how it's going to come out. So it'll be interesting to see how it actually does come out. 
And we also, that reminds me, we do have, um, if you look at tripwire.com slash blog, we do have a really interesting interview with Nira Jones um, that we shot while at InfoSec Europe in April, where she talks about how compliance and risk need to be aligned. Uh, you might want to take a look at that, because it was a really good interview by, by Nira at Barclays Card. Uh, the second question, yeah, what, Wayne. Oh, go ahead. Just one quick comment on this. So in the bottom right of the slide, you see the Tripwire Twitter account and our hashtag RiskyBiz2012. Uh, if you pay attention to those on Twitter as we kind of take different slices of this data as the other country reports are posted and things like that, that's a good way to find out about that uh, pretty efficiently. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, the other question that's similar to the one that we got yesterday with the America's webcast was, how do you get your message across when your organization is just starting it? It's not a large organization. It's a small and medium size, and they might not even see risk or security as relevant to what they do. How do you get started? Uh, yeah, and it's, it's going to be different based on the culture of the organization, but generally a couple of places I've seen work is, um, you know, trying to align with, um, someone who already kind of understands risk. And, and depending on your organization, that could be, you know, uh, a f your head financial person. Whether you've got a CFO or not, you probably have someone who is uh, well acquainted with risks and controls from things like GAP and financial accounting and things like that. Um, so uh, the other thing is because they tend to control the purse strings, they have a good audience with the rest of the senior leaders in the company and can oftentimes help you not only push, um, you know, things forward, but help uh, ensure that people pay attention and get aligned around that. Um, if you're in a larger organization and you have uh, maybe a chief legal officer uh, who's generally concerned about risk to the corporation, that may be a good ally to help you uh, drive some early visibility around your efforts and help you identify what metrics or what outcomes might be meaningful to keep some momentum. Um, and then the third area is one that I think, um, you know, a lot of organizations kind of overlook. If you happen to have an internal audit function in your company, um, remember they're on your side, and uh, they already speak the language of risk. They chances are have the audience uh, that you're looking for, which is senior management for support, uh, maybe an audit committee, um, you know, and they tend to uh, be – pretty good at articulating priorities based on risk, and I've seen a lot of organizations that have been very effective in engaging with internal audit to help drive a risk-based security management program. There's a couple of questions here that I'll address really quickly um, in terms of how do we get more um, KPI information? Do you have a handbook? Well, Dwayne has written a lot of information on security uh, metrics on our blog, uh, tripwire.com slash blog. If you search for his um, names, he's written five or six blog posts about, you know, what are the things that we should be measuring, uh, what are the things that I'm seeing out there in the industry. Uh, and if you have any idea of what's working for you and would like to share it, I, I know he's very um, welcoming of that as, as we tease him. He, that's his new hobby, collecting security metrics. Um, the other question that we have here is uh, in terms of more resources on tripwire solutions. And if you go to our website, there are um, short videos that outline our solutions in terms of what we're talking about, as well as longer archived webcasts that you're more than welcome to download and see. There's uh, upcoming Lunch and Learns that I know our team in EMEA is um, is producing. So if you're interested, uh, just let us know and we can add you to that distribution list. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal so that she can wrap it up. And thank you all for your attendance today. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Duane, uh, both of you, for a really interesting presentation on the State of Risk-Based Security Management Poneman Report. Uh, before I do wrap it up, I just want to quickly remind all of you that you can get the full report that includes more details around what Cindy and Duane talked about um, from the attachments but button in your player today up at the top. Um, it'll lead you directly to the page where you can then download either the UK or US report. Um, the, the, the presentation slides are also available from that same button, so you can go ahead and get this presentation today as well. Thank you again all for your attention, and we look forward to being in touch with you again.